Well, hey everybody, good morning, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. I know for many of you in the room, the only reason you're in the building is because you wanted to get out of the wind and we're fine with it. So glad you're here. We really hope that this series, as we kind of uh, come out of Easter, has given you opportunity to think a little bit about some of those assumptions we make, those secrets that we keep that somehow, for some of us, we actually think that we've kept those secrets from God and that's kept us from him, but he knew all those things. And we talked a little bit about that last week, if you missed it. Uh, This week, we're going to talk about some of the secrets, unfortunately, that get pretty well kept inside a church. Like, why would this matter? Why does a community like this fit into our faith? Why is it so important. And so I hope that as we reveal some of those, it's really helpful to you. That if you're somebody that's like a, uh, I'm not sure I'm dipping my toe back into faith or church for the first time or for the first time in a long time, that you can find purpose in that. And then for some of you, you've been walking into these doors, you've been sitting in these seats or you've been joining us online, but you've been a spiritual free agent for a really long time. And uh, God wants something more for you than that. And so we're going to talk about that together. But before we get started, I'm gonna pray for us. And if you've never been here before or never heard me speak, I pray kneeling. And the reason that I do that is to remind my heart and to remind us as a community how essential it is that we're not doing this in isolation. We're doing this together. We're approaching the throne room of the king together. Would you pray with me? God, we do, we acknowledge that right now we pray to you sitting on a throne, hearing us because of the work of Jesus. And so we pray, God, that as we examine our own lives and we examine the way that you call us to live them, the better way to live our lives, that's not easier, but it's with you, that, God, you would challenge our perspective and, God, you would give us us some steps to take today that would bring greater life, greater freedom, and greater joy. It's in Jesus' name, amen. So there's a line that you have thought before, and the line is this, what's their secret? See, we use this, sometimes we say it out loud, sometimes we say it in our mind, but it's, it's kind of how we wonder about people who have figured it out. Maybe it's someone that you envy the success of or someone who's been navigating the challenges that you can't figure out. We wonder because we know that they have the same number of hours in the day. We know we're pretty sure that they put on their pants one leg at a time, right? But yet they've discovered something that we haven't. And I know that this isn't always the case, But I hope that you have felt that way with someone that's a follower of Jesus along the way, that you looked at their life and it wasn't that everything was perfect, but that you saw the way that they modeled their life was worth figuring out the details of. Now, that's not to say that for some of you who aren't Christians, like actually people of faith, people that are followers of Jesus, maybe some of the reasons you've stayed clear for a little while as well, but I hope there is somebody that you have seen this example modeled incredibly well with. And maybe that person is the reason why you're here today or it's why you're watching online right now. You've seen the obstacles that they've overcome and you know that if you face the same obstacles, it would not have worked out the same way. Now, something that is far from a secret in our culture is that you and I are understood to be most successful. We are understood to be really at the peak when we are self-made, when we have figured out everything on our own. And Maybe you know this already, but that actually is not true. There's no one that's self-made. We all depend on others to our benefit, and we have isolated ourselves to our detriment. Obviously, this week, we can all think about and talk about Elon Musk. Um, He's somebody that's built company after company, and he just made a major move to buy Twitter that you either love or you think is the end of civilization. And uh, the thing is, like, we think about him as self-made, but he has teams and teams of people at all of these different companies that are the only reason that they're able to be successful. Not only that, he was able to receive funding from his father as a child and a young man for lots of the startup ideas that he had early on. It doesn't mean that he hasn't done big things. It just means that he didn't do them alone. And I think it's so important for us to take the pressure off that we have to figure it out, that we have to do it all on our own. At an individual level, um, there have been plenty of times when I got in over my head on something, on a project, and usually I'm pretty technologically savvy, so if it has to do with technology, I'm like, I can handle this. Uh, But if it's mechanical at all, uh, I'm probably going to break something. And uh, I put in a Nest thermostat, which is like a smart thermostat, and I was like, this connects to Wi-Fi, this is my lane, I got it. 
And I start to put it in, but then you pull the old one off and there's all these wires. And in the middle of the winter, when you don't know what to do with those wires and your heater stops working, it's a problem. And so uh, I called a friend, phoned a friend and had them come over and help me because I couldn't do it alone, right? See, I, I think that for all of us, we can recognize that the DIY approach, that I can do it all by myself approach is everywhere. That's what YouTube is for, right? We have self-checkout lanes everywhere to shave a little bit more time off. We can wander around the Home Depot looking for the next power tool that we can't live without, but we really don't know how to live with either. They all carry different level of risk. We know that when I try to do certain things by myself, it could end badly. But the thing is, we do this with our faith too. And DIY faith is actually uniquely dangerous and damaging to us. Because what we'll see is when we do that, when we live isolated, when we try to do it on our own, especially in our faith, it's that united we grow and divided we go. We go in all the worst directions. We go into all the wrong patterns. There is something so healthy when we function together. So if we can't do this alone, if we aren't designed to, then we have to grow with others. And for some of you, that's hard because you've been burned, you've felt alienated, and I get that, but Maybe you've heard this line before. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And it's it's one of those phrases, right, that's kind of trite, but it's also true. We've been here in Colorado for six years. I've been doing ministry for more than 20 years, and I have lived both sides of this statement. Especially in my 20s, it was easy to justify the fast pace of work and the fact that since it seemed like others either couldn't do something well or couldn't do it as fast as I felt like I could, if I wanted it done correctly or quickly, I would just do it myself. And the lesson that stuck with me through my 20s was that if I wanted to do anything, I had to do it myself. And the problem with that is, if you don't know this already, it's pretty exhausting. Now, I can remember early in ministry setting up a wrestling gym in a student space that had 100 chairs, a stage, a sound system, and I didn't even think about asking for help. There were people who wanted to help, who would have been eager to help, but they just assumed that I had what I needed because I hadn't asked. And that's what isolation does to us. Isolation pushes people away from us, and then we get angry and bitter that people are walking away from us when it's actually our behavior that has created that reaction. And the thing is, it's not just exhausting, it is that, it's also unfulfilling. Whatever progress you've made is temporary when it all depends on you and me. When you're having to spin the plates and keep it going, eventually you're gonna stop spinning the plates. And the thing about life is the real fruits, you know this, the real fruits are relationships. They're the kinds of people and connections that outlast the project that you're on. They outlast the grade that you're in. They outlast the season of life that you're experiencing. They're the kinds of things that even when you're done, even when you retire, even when this life for you is over, the legacy that lasts is through relationships. But when we all try to be spiritual free agents, those get missed or messed up along the way. The early church simply didn't have an understanding of someone who was an isolated Christian. The modern idea that might, somebody might say, well, I'm a Christian, I just don't do church. That would have made no sense to the first century church. See, for them, they understood what it meant to follow Jesus as being interconnected together forever. Back in James' letter that we studied last week, in the final chapter, he's gonna paint a picture for us of this kind of community. He says it this way. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. That question that he starts with, right? Who is among you is a really important question. Specifically, he's asking, hey, you know what? What about these fellow followers of Jesus that are in your life that you consider close to you personally? 
Who has something on you that because they're friends with you, you're like, oh, we're good. But if all of a sudden they weren't friends with you, you'd be a little concerned about what they would do with what they know about you. Those kinds of relationships are the metric for real relationships where we have let people into parts of our life where there is meat, there is risk. That's what real relationships are. See, when those kinds of people are in trouble, Here's what we're tempted to do in our life. We're tempted to jump into action, aren't we? We're tempted to fix it. But James, he challenges us to pray first. Before we try to fix it, before we jump in the car, before we set up the meal train. I mean, we can do all that stuff, but before we do any of that, if we love God and we love them, then we start by taking their trouble to the only one who can ultimately fix it. And you know, that's really what prayer is. Not only are we believing that God can do something miraculous in that situation, in that circumstance, in that person's life, but we also want to model the dependency and the humility that we remember, God, you're in control. You're in charge. I'm not. So before I do anything, I want to talk to you about it. But then, James, he he paints a picture of engaging with people throughout the spectrum of our life experiences. If somebody in your life is happy, don't be the rain cloud. Find a way to encourage them. Sometimes we feel like we have to always bring the the devil's advocate perspective. The world's got enough of that. You can encourage people in your life too. James says, how do we meet people where they are? But James gives us a really unique step to take if someone is sick. He says something um, that might feel weird to us, especially if you've never seen this done or if you've seen it done weirdly. Um, he, he says that the sick should be brought to the elders in order to be prayed over and anointed with oil in the name of the Lord. And if you came at Easter and you were like, this seemed not super weird, so I came back and you're like, the last couple weeks, Phil, you said some weird stuff. This is one of those. So let me break down a couple details for you. Elders are church leaders, kind of like a nonprofit board that oversee the spiritual and strategic health of a church community like ours. We have a board of seven elders that do this for all of us. They're godly men that are selected from within our community, not because we think men are better than women. We think men and women are both equal, that they have been created in the image of God with infinite dignity, value, and worth, but what we see throughout the New Testament is that men and women inside the church have unique functions, and this is one of those unique functions. And so then he talks about anointing with oil. And I don't believe that it's like a potion. That's not what we're talking about when it's an oil. It's not magical. I actually think it symbolizes the presence of God's spirit in the prayer and healing process. And so we do this, like we do this pretty regularly. And um, the question that you're asking is, does it work? Like when you pray for someone like this, does it work? And my answer is, it always works, sincerely. Now, for some people, it works immediately. Like, I've watched God do dramatic healings. I've watched us pray for someone that has cancer, and the next week they show up to a scan and the cancer's gone, and there's no explanation, and we give credit to God. I've watched God heal someone eventually, and it involves surgery and treatments and doctors and prayer on top of it, and we we celebrate that. We give credit to God for that. And I've watched people who's Life ends on this earth with that prayer never answered, but as followers of Jesus, they will be whole and healed in heaven forever. It always works. God will always deliver you and me from the thing that we're praying for. He will always do it, whether it's now, later, or in eternity. And I know that feels kind of like a cop-out, and you're like, okay, yeah, we get it. You're a pastor. For some time, it's gonna happen. But let me put it this way. Every time that Jesus does something in your life, every time you pray for something and the circumstances of your life here get better, it's always temporary. You got, God, I'm sick. I don't feel well. Would you heal me for now? God, uh, you know, this financial situation, uh, like uh, there's more month than money. I need your help. Yeah, yeah, for now. But they are all temporary on purpose that what Jesus did for you and me by dying in our place and coming back from the dead, is he secured eternal healing. He secured eternal relationship with him. And when we pray for something now, it reminds us that we are not in the eternity that we were made for yet. And so this is an important process. I think it's really important. Even if the outcome we're praying for in the moment doesn't happen the way we want or when we want, it's still 
eventually happens. And I believe that God uses this process to draw us closer to him and to draw us closer to one another. Then he talks about how important confession of sin is to one another for real prayer and care for one another because of how powerful prayer is. And sometimes this gets connected to that sickness idea we just talked about. And there's this idea that someone's physical sickness is always connected to their sinfulness. But see, that was a problem in the first century that Jesus debunked over and over and over again. James is not trying to say every one of your sicknesses is always connected to your personal sin. But this is about how do we function in relationship comprehensively. Sometimes it's celebrating. Sometimes it's praying for one another. Sometimes it's confessing to one another. That that we shouldn't just have one-dimensional relationships. That's what James is trying to explain in context. Years ago, our daughter Maisie had a really bad fall, and we had to get her to the hospital really quickly. It was a Saturday night, and we immediately texted our community group to tell them what had happened and ask them to pray for us. And they were sending prayers via text message to me. And by the time we got to the hospital, there was a family on their way to take our oldest from us so that we could be there with her. We didn't ask them to do that. And they weren't asking to do it. That was the level of friendship. They were praying and then they were helping. And the kind of community that you don't have to ask for things, but they offer things is a huge gift. And what we talked about last week is the best time to develop that community is before you need it. More than that, James is showing the power of having a group of people in our lives with a shared spiritual vision, not only for themselves, but for us too. Do you have that? Like not just people that root for the same sports team as you. Not just people that, you know, they have the same hobbies as you. Not just people that show up to the same Starbucks that you do. Like not not just that level, but people that say following Jesus is central to my life and you following Jesus is central to your life. How do we do that together? That's so incredibly important. I know that for some of you, you're just kind of dipping your toes back in the water of church and faith. And for some of you, you have been using church like a spectator sport for years and you just haven't really ever gotten engaged. Maybe because you got burned, you got burned out, you got frustrated, but we actually have an environment specifically made for you, we call it 321 Launch, and it's just about ready to get started. If you want more information or you wanna sign up, you can go to ehills.org slash weekend and uh, click on it and sign up for it. But it's a short-term group that will give you a taste of this, that will give you an opportunity to sample community that could make a huge difference in your life. So if you've never known where to start, and you're like, what do I do next? Maybe try this. Because united we grow and divided we go. You will eventually spin out you will eventually watch your faith deteriorate if you try to be a spiritual free agent. You can't do this alone, none of us can. Growing with others is essential to our faith, but it's not enough to just do life with people. We have to have a target, like an actual direction that we are pulling one another towards, and that direction is to grow in faith to grow in faith. Not only do we wanna grow together, not only do we wanna have relationships together, we wanna make sure that those relationships have a target, they have a north star of what it means for our faith to grow over time. Who do you have in your life that you really believe in? Like, that you know you can count on. Maybe it's someone at work for you that you know you can count on them. Maybe it's somebody in your family that you're like, oh, they got it, it's gonna be great. Maybe it's a classmate or a teammate at school that you know, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna make sure that that's covered, that's covered. It's like the group project that you get assigned and that person's in your group and you're like, oh, phew, I don't have to do anything. You know, like, who is that person for you? It makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Over the course of COVID on our staff, I've watched lots of team members on our staff have to step up and care in ways that are above and beyond, way beyond their job description. And and probably the person on our staff team who has had to do this with the most difficulty and the least visibility is Ben Ramsey, our care pastor. He has done more funerals, more hospital visits, more counseling sessions than probably ever before. And here's what I love about Ben. In addition to his huge biceps, which are like concerningly large. Can we admit that together? If you don't know who I'm talking about, go look him up on the website. Like, like is that swelling? What's happening? Anyway, um, The thing that I love about Ben is that his attitude is genuinely loving for all of us. He really does care about us and he wants to help. And so what I know is when I ask Ben for help on something, it might take a minute because he's got a lot going on, but I know that he's got it. 
I know that he cares. I know that he's gonna take care of it. And that changes the way that I relate to him, changes the way that I trust and depend on him. And here's what's funny. Even though I have someone like that in my life, even though hopefully you have somebody like that in your life, it doesn't always translate to the way that I think about God as it should. See, God is always there. He always shows up. He's always faithful. But how often do I assume that I have to go back and set up the wrestling gym by myself again? See, James points out the problem by sharing a really unique story in this passage. He says this, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Now, if you don't know the name Elijah or you've been kind of following us the last couple weeks, this is a unique moment because James is actually stepping from the first century AD in the New Testament back into the Hebrew scriptures, specifically 1 Kings in what we call our Old Testament. And he's talking about a specific prophet. In the Old Testament prophets, they tried to get the attention of God's people Israel on behalf of God to either keep them obedient or way more often challenge them to turn from the errors that they were living and choose to follow God again. And so God uses this specific prophet Elijah to pray for and predict three and a half years without rain in order to pull God's people back. And so if you think like April has been pretty dry around here, think about that for three and a half years in an economy that's entirely dependent on agriculture. That's the situation that Elijah was in the middle of. See, God, he protected and he provided for Elijah during the drought, but it was all for this bigger purpose of bringing Israel back into obedience and relationship with God. Prophets, they often had to say very difficult things to cultures that did not want to hear them. They did not want to believe them. And they delivered the message of God for their judgment, making them very unpopular throughout their ministry. They were in a context where people knew better, but they weren't living better. Does that sound familiar? At one point in Jesus' earthly ministry, his followers were amazed that he could, in a moment, make a fig tree wither. And Jesus, like he would often do, he uses this as a teachable moment. He says this to his disciples. He says, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. We trust people in our lives, but what if we trusted the God of our lives like this? Now, Jesus wasn't saying that we have a blank check with prayer, that if you just say some magic words, God will just do whatever you want, whenever you want. That unfortunately has been the way this passage gets ripped out of context and used. Always, 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 what we pray has to be in submission to God's will and plan. He will never answer a prayer that's counter to his will. So our goal is to know his will more and more and pray towards it. And when we do, when we do, we pray to a God with this kind of power. Not only that, when we take these verses in their context, what Jesus is saying is that this kind of faith, this kind of belief, and this kind of power takes place in the context of community, not by ourselves. When's the last time that you prayed for a miracle? Like something that couldn't happen without God's intervention. I know that for some of you, this is like probably a little uncomfortable because you're just sort of thinking about getting back into church world and you're like, "Ah, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. But I would challenge you, this is probably something you're more ready for than you think. So here's what I would encourage you to think about. I think for most of us in the West, what we have a tendency to do is we narrow our prayers down to the possible. We think this is the plan, here are my circumstances, here's the doctors that are available, here's the treatments that are available, here are the finances that I know that are coming in, here's the past with this relationship. And once we know what's possible and we know kind of our plan about how to solve for it, we say, God, most of our prayers are like this, God, would you use the thing that I planned without talking to you about it to deliver me from the circumstances that I would have never been in if I'd walked in obedience with you? Right, like that's... Like that feels a little too on the nose, but that's how we often pray. But like, what if we prayed for the impossible? What if we confess, God, I'm in this situation because 
they made a mistake or I made a mistake or I made a bunch of mistakes or God, I'm, on this, I'm in this situation because I never saw it coming and I wasn't ready for it. God, I, I couldn't have done anything to prepare for this. What would it look like to pray for that family member to turn to Jesus for the first time or to turn back for the first time in a long time, that family member that has only ever had angry conversations with you? What would it look like for your marriage to grow warm with love again, even with a spouse who doesn't follow Jesus? What would it look like for that crisis that you're avoiding dealing with to be worked on by God before you were even having the conversation? Like God can work in that person's heart and in the circumstances of both of you right now, would you ask him to do that? See, the God of miracles can do all of that if you'll believe it, if you'll pray for it. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna give you a minute right now to do just that. Think of what hurts the most, what feels the most impossible, and pray. Maybe it's with somebody that you came with, you'll pray with them, maybe you'll just pray by yourself right now, that's okay. But don't pray prayers that let God off the hook. Pray like he can and will show up in ways and in circumstances that are beyond your imagination. And pray in a way like you're gonna keep praying for it until something changes. And pray in a way that you trust God even when he hasn't answered the prayer yet. Because the purpose of prayer is not just for the temporary fulfillment of what you're praying for. It's connecting you to the ultimate reality of heaven. It's connecting you to the fact that this world and this life is not everything. And so we can pray that heaven would enter earth and enter that circumstance and situation and deliver us from it. Maybe you will do it now, maybe he'll do it later, maybe he'll do it in heaven. But this prayer lets you connect to God in that moment. Take a moment and pray. God, one minute of talking to you can change things. One moment that together we surrender to you and we ask you to show up in these areas of our lives can change things. They can change things in us. They can change things around us. God, would you remind us of these areas? Would you challenge us to pray bigger, to grow our faith, to believe that you and only you can show up in miraculous ways in our life? In Jesus' name. Do you feel that even for just a minute? Even for just a minute, we aligned our hearts together. We prayed to the God of the universe that he would show up in miraculous ways. You know what it reminds us of? It reminds us that united we can grow together. Even, even though our requests are different, even though we're praying individually, we get to pray collectively. And that divided, we go in a million different directions in a world that is hopelessly divided on its own. We're not designed to be spiritual free agents. Now this last part of the secret of church it might feel a little out of step with how we think on a regular basis, so give me a minute. But the third thing that we need to grow in is we need to grow in judgment. We need to grow in judgment. The Bible says that Christians are supposed to love non-Christians and that we're supposed to hold fellow Christians accountable that we're in relationship with for the path of following Jesus that they have committed to. That's what we're supposed to do. Love non-Christians, judge fellow Christians that we're in relationship with. That's what we're supposed to do. But unfortunately, I think sometimes we have spiritual dyslexia. And you know this, if you're not a church person, you're like, that's the way you're supposed to do this? Because sometimes we do exactly the opposite. Sometimes in Christian circles, we're like, well, I don't wanna judge them. I don't know what's going on in their life. And with the non-Christian who hasn't even said, I'm gonna follow Jesus and isn't trying to do it, we are judging their face off and they don't even know about it, right? We have to flip that paradigm. It doesn't mean that you and I don't apply any judgment. It's that we're supposed to apply it to the right people and in the right way. Do you remember the first time that you bought a car? 
My first time buying a car as an adult was an experience that maybe you've had too, which is I, I kind of had to fake my way through it. The process that everything was happening, I had to pretend that from the, the kind of sales process to the test drive to negotiating price to the favorite part for all of us in buying a car, probably the finance office. And they were all things that I wasn't familiar with. And I'm sure it goes without saying that I did not get the best deal on that very first car that I bought. But I learned my lesson. The cars that I've purchased for our family or for friends since then, uh, they've been a lot different. Usually I go in with more knowledge of the specific car that I want than the person that's trying to sell it to me. See, the thing is, I, I know the price that I'm willing to pay. I understand the nuances of the purchase in a way that lets me confidently judge and discern the deal that I'm being offered. It takes time, but it's worth the investment. And I think sometimes in our relationships, we struggle with that. I think sometimes the first time that we get burned relationally or we watch someone burn out in their faith, we kind of fake our way through it as well. But like, have you learned? Have you kept growing in that relationship? Have you made sure that the next time is better than the last time? There's actually a process of what this can look like that James talks about here. It says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Remember, these are Christians that James is talking to and talking about not only that, he's specifically calling out someone among you and me, someone that we are in relationship with. He's talking about the benefits of repentance, of going from one way in our life, one pattern of living and changing it of heart changes that realize the error of their ways and are willing to change. Here's the thing, you are not actually responsible for someone in your life changing that you have to have a difficult conversation with. God gives you a specific task to challenge them, but God is the one that will change them. If you've ever been to a public location like an airport, you've seen signs and you've heard announcements that say, you finish it for me, if you see something, Say something, and it's a good strategy, right? Because they know that all of our eyeballs are gonna see way more than their security force ever could. The problem for us as Christians is that sometimes we either feel no responsibility to people in our life that are close to us, or we feel so much responsibility that we do this for people we have no business doing this for because we don't know them. I've often said that we need to build relationships with bridges that are strong enough to support the difficult and inevitable conversations that are a part of relationships and are necessary for our growth. And I think this passage gives you and me an opportunity to be reminded that if there are people in your life that never let you get beneath the surface, if there are people in your life that only have surface level relationships, you should be very careful and thoughtful with your boundaries about those people because whether they're doing it consciously or subconsciously, what they don't realize but what they're doing is they are making it so that no one can challenge them. They're making it so that no one sees what's real. They're making it so that they get to live exactly the way they want for as long as they want. And those blind spots that all of us have have to get challenged and changed by people we let close. James says that if you see something, say something, and God does something, and then you've rescued that person from the consequences of their sin. We talked about this last week if you missed it. Sin and temptation, trials, go check it out. But the impact that that sin and stopping that pattern in their life can have, it doesn't just benefit them. It doesn't just benefit their family. It doesn't just benefit other people in their life. It benefits you. Like if you're in relationship with them, you gotta stop the pain. Stop the choices that are hurting so many people. The kind of loving judgment, it, this kind of loving judgment, it demands we ask a really important question. This is it. Are you willing to sacrifice someone's affection for you? for their connection with God. And I think if the answer is no, if you're like, I just need everybody to like me, I need this person to like me, I don't want the relationship to go sideways, I'm just telling you, you are settling for a very, very disposable relationship. That relationship will grow better over time if you have courage. Who do you have in your life that has this kind of access? Not spiritual accountability cops that you can lie to, but guys, do you have guys in your life that really know you and really know your mess and really know your tendencies? Do you have those people in your life? You should. 
Ladies, do you have ladies in your life that things go beyond the facade, beyond the Instagram timeline, beyond how everything's always perfect in every photo to what's really going on? The first step is to engage people at that level, people that bring out the best in you. And if you're like, I think I have some people in my life like that, I've just never engaged in a relationship like that. Well, maybe today's the day to try. And if you're like, I have no idea how to do that, where do I start? Three, two, one, launch, go check it out. It could be really helpful. See, on our online Bible study this week, I asked a question, I asked people about unexpected close friendships in their life. And two themes came up in those close friendships. One was time and one was trials. The relationships that really mattered had stood the test of time and when difficulty came, they worked through it rather than running from it. Some of my closest friends in ministry are people that I had been through the fire with, people that I had to admit mistakes to, that admitted mistakes to me, that we had to work through challenging situations. They're the kinds of relationships where growth and unity, they aren't just buzzwords, they actually matter, they cost us something. See, easy relationships, they're temporary, they're disposable. Relationships that face trials and come out on the other side, they have durability that really makes a difference. They're the kind of relationships that you can pick up the phone months later and pick up right where you left off with someone. But it's more than comfort and convenience. We have to let our secrets out so that there's space for grace to come into those relationships too. Here's the thing, in 2022, this is, this is a concept that gets lost on a lot of us. Disagreement is unavoidable. We will all disagree in relationships. We will all disagree. Disagreement is unavoidable, but division is a choice. You get to decide whether you work through your disagreements and maintain and actually enhance a relationship or if your disagreement will always become division as our culture is constantly challenging us to do. See, for us, we can... We can let our relationships, they can can stand the test of time. They can stand the test of trials. Jesus actually prays that they would. Jesus in a prayer called the high priestly prayer, he's praying to God the Father and he says this, he says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. Are one. Disagreement, unavoidable. Division, that's a choice, and so is unity. Jesus prayed that we would have it. These past couple weeks have been an attempt to reveal your secrets aren't too big for God, and the secrets of God and the help that he has for you, they don't have to be secrets anymore. And even if church has seemed unnecessarily divisive for you in the past, I hope you, you sense that we wanna be a community that places Jesus above everything, and lets him work it out. See, there's this amazing power that unity has that lets us grow. And there's this amazing path that God has for you in it. Can I pray for you? God, I lift up each person in this room, everyone that's watching online. God, I know it's hard, it's, it's really difficult in the midst of so much pain and so much loss and so much disappointment, oftentimes in people for us to get back up on the saddle, for us to try again. But God, I pray that you would give us the courage to do it. That God, by your hand, you would design the person and the people that could exist in community with us, that call us to greater and greater connection to you. Thank you that you never give up on us, God. Thank you that you show up even when we don't. And I pray that right now, God, we would be reminded that we are not spiritual free agents, that we need one another. Help us to lean into that now. It's in Jesus' name, amen.